feedback. It was a good. Okay, thank you all for coming, those of you that are here, and those of you that are online, uh, to our membership meeting on May 4th. And uh, we're still in what I'm counting as our 50th year. Um, so, on uh, next slide, Nick. Okay, I'm, I, I'm admitting people at the same time, so. Okay. I will be a little bit slower than I would like to be. So, yeah, I'm your president, uh, Ann Paul. And um, thank you for having that confidence in me. I'm really enjoying being president. So, okay, I, and I always bring this up. I know those of you who have attended these meetings before are going in, we know this part, but I always feel that it's very important. Back to the other, back up. Sorry. Um, very important for us to recognize that uh, Tampa Audubon is a chapter of the National Audubon Society, and um, we are also a part of Audubon Florida, and um, that our mission is, and it's on the other slide where it's really easy for me to say, but it's for to protect birds, wildlife, and the habitats and support them using um, education, advocacy, and uh, public uh, involvement. So, um, so these are kind of the, the basis of who we are. There are actually two other Audubon chapters in Hillsborough County. I don't know if you know that, but we also share a very vibrant Audubon chaptership in, the, in um, Florida with 44 chapters in our state, including very many of them around this part of uh, the state. So, so that's kind of great to know too. So next slide. So tonight, one of the things that we really need to do as part of our business meeting is to elect our officers. Um, so the, the way our bylaws are set up, we have staggered terms. So that the idea being um, that we don't replace all of our officers in one year so that we can keep some continuity of experience within the society. I think that's a really good idea. So these officers are not up for election this year. Um, so I get to continue till next year as your president um, and our secretary and treasurer are continuing, but we have the one year board members who are continuing too. And, and I just wanna say, uh, Lucy is here tonight. Thank you, Lucy, for, for being on our board. And, um, and uh, Sandy and Michelle are both out of town. So, um, and so is Sherry. So, okay, next slide. Um, so this is the slate of officers that we need to vote on. So um, Jessica is here and she is running for vice president uh, and it's a, uh, uh, she's replacing Ta Tammy Lyons who has to step back. And then um, our two year term electors are Jim, Jim is here. And uh, Jonathan, thank you, Jonathan, for being willing to do this. And Mick, yay, Mick. And um, Doug Deneuve had thought he could serve, but now it turns out his plans are changing. He's moving out of the state. So we're gonna miss Doug. Um, but our one year term that's come up is Logan. So Logan, thank you so much for being willing to serve. And um, so, one of the things that we would need to do is elect these officers. So barring the people whose name is on this slate, do we have someone who would like to propose from the, from the um, membership, you guys, or uh, from the participants online that we accept the slate of officers as, pre as prepared by and offered by the board of directors? I make the motion that we accept the slate of board members and officers of the slide. Do we have a second to the motion? Second. Lucy seconded. Okay. Um, do we have any other discussion about this? Okay. Since there's no other discussion, um, let, me, uh, let me pose that for the people at home. Any discussion? I took it off of. Okay. Full screen. No other discussion. So let's call the motion to uh, a vote. All in favor, either if you're here, raise your hand to say 
you're in favor, or if you're online, please raise your hand or do something that um, <laughs> lets us know that you're in favor. So uh, because we are recording this, this is an official, official thing. So if you're okay, we have a lot of hands go up. Everybody who's here, can, you can vote for yourself. Yeah. It's all right. Um, okay, so everyone has here. This has been unanimous here. It's been Just, no negatives here. Some people not voting. I got some finger votes. Hey, thank you, everybody. It, uh, they're doing a good job. The people I can see. Okay. All right. So, so the good news now is that uh, we have uh, new officers, and I really appreciate it. Your term will actually start in um, June with the new new fiscal year. But that being said, we will definitely invite you, everyone, to the upcoming um, board meeting that will be shortly. So we still have our funny boxes. What's happening every time there's something that pops up here for some reason, and the Zoom is appearing up there. I don't know why, but it goes away after a moment as I clear the screen. Okay. So next, you know, just a couple of announcements that we'll go through. Yeah, that's the next slide. Okay, so we have field trips every weekend, essentially, in May. A lot of active field trips. There's a lot of birds to look at, a lot of fun places that we're going. Um, I always like to let people, remind people about the Native Plant Society um, field trip at Lettuce Lake Park. And then we're going to Lake Dan. Then I'm leading the field trip to uh, Lettuce Lake Park in, on the 13th of May. And um, Mick? is leading two field trips toward the end of the month um, to McIntosh Preserve and also the Jefferson. L Lily Saw is going to take Jefferson. Okay. On the 27th, I'm going to be doing a Schultz survey that weekend. Oh, okay. So Lily and Saw will be doing the um, 27th field trip. It's current on our website. Go to our website for to sign up. You can see how to sign up on our website. And these are a lot of fun. So everybody, you know, sign up. I think um, my beginning bird trip is just about full. So, okay, next one. And um, this trip is now sold out, right, Mick? But we are creating a wait list. You know, it's not gonna happen until next January and, and people make plans, but sometimes they have to change them. So if you wanna go on this trip, don't lose hope. You can sign up and maybe you'll get lucky and be on the wait list and it'll be all right. So. We don't know about these boxes. Okay, next <laughs> next slide. I'm, I'm all right, Microsoft tonight. So Mick is asking for some help about what, how we design. He's in, he's our field trip coordinator, but we want to know where do you want to go, and do you want to help lead field trips, or do you have somebody that you know that would help lead field trips? Um, we really have fun on our field trips, and so if, if there's a place you want to go, if you want to lead one yourself. Um, it's pretty easy to lead a Tampa Audubon field trip. Uh, Logan's been with me when I, <laughs> I said, I don't know the warblers that well. And he helped with the warbler trip, you know, warbler ID and all of that is, and everybody's spots. So um, we all have fun when we're on our trip. So, you know, raise your hand and let Mick know, or just call up and let him know that you have some ideas. Okay, next. Um, we're continuing our bird surveys out at Schultz and at Frog Creek Restoration Project down in Manatee County. So these are really interesting and really fun and they give a scientific basis for those properties. Um, and it's turned out to be some of the more important things that we do in terms of being able to document what animals are on what sites. And that's been important in helping preserve those sites too. So it's great. So next one. And um, we are looking for a volunteer coordinator right now. Jessica and I are gonna co-volunteer coordinate out at uh, the, the Joel Jackson Nature Center. Um, and we are asking for docents. What, what we coordinate are the docents. <laughs> and um, the job of the docents is just to be kind of an interpreter at the nature center when the nature, when the park is really busy, which is weekend and holiday days in the afternoon. And um, mostly it's just 
visiting with some enthusiasm with people when they come in with questions. You don't have to know all the answers. We've got books there to look things up. That's an important learning activity as well. It's really kind of a, a lot of fun. So um, and uh, once a month, uh, the Native Plant Society is working on the garden out there. And that's something to do too out at Lettuce Lake Park. OK, next. And then we have three really big projects that we're working on. Tammy Lyons is heading up Project Colony Watch, where you can adopt a bird colony near you and kind of keep an eye on it. And that um, helps us work with the uh, Audubon, Florida uh, Coastal Island staff and helps protect these important inland colonies where we're growing a lot of the, the wading birds in the region. And then Project Burrow is something we're trying to help reestablish a um, burrowing owl population in the Tampa Bay area where it used to be very important here. And those owls have kind of winked out with the development. And then of course our, our spectacular bluebird trails. We're up, up to more than five bluebird trails. I think we have six or seven. I keep losing track because it's so dynamic with that. But um, bluebird trails in Hillsborough County and all, that's a lot to be proud of. We're growing a lot of little birds. Of course, the birds are doing all the work, but not all of it. We're providing the, um, the boxes, okay. And if you haven't seen our hooked birds video, this is something please share with your fishermen friends or, or anybody, all of us who get out in the environment have an opportunity to sometimes save the life of a bird that's entangled in fishing line, and you need to know how to do it safely. So please watch that. And um, the, we've actually, we're producers for three um, films, and that's pretty cool for, a, for an Audubon chapter. Okay, next. Um, the Young Birders Club is something we're participating in with the Florida Ornithological Society and, and two of the other uh, areas in Florida. St. Augustine is part of this and also the Orlando uh, chapters too. So, but on May 13th, which is you know Saturday after this, um, there's gonna be a chance for our young birders to actually win binoculars. So this is pretty fun. Plus, um, you know, just get out and do some birding. So next. And again, I just wanted to bring up avian flu again. Uh, turns out some of the California condors have been dying of avian flu as well as um, the white, white pelicans and particularly uh, black vultures are very vulnerable, apparently. Um, this is a, a disease that's really affecting our capacity in the United States to produce chicken eggs and stuff like that. So it's quite a serious thing. So if you have um, birds that have died in your, in your yard, be careful, don't pick them up. There's not any uh, information yet about bird flu being transferred to people, but don't let you be the first one. So be careful with that. So, okay, next. And of course the trailblazer helps us find out what the, our conservation lands uh, folks are doing to protect um, uh, the manage the resources that we've purchased through the environmental lands program. Always fun to keep up with them. Next. And we do have a field trip coming up with John Costin. We're still working out the details, but it'll be in June on a Saturday. We're gonna go to the um, Tampa Bay History Center and look at his artwork. So it's a air conditioned field trip and we'll let you know more information about that uh, as we get it developed. And our next meeting is um, the joint meeting with uh, the Suncoast Native Plant Society and the Tampa group of the Sierra Club. And it's gonna be here on July 12th. And the speaker is William Frude. And um, I think we're all gonna really enjoy that. Um, if you, there will shortly be online more information about his talk but he works with the FSTOF Foundation and you can look that up. Um, particularly it's using photography for conservation. So really that's gonna be quite dramatic and I think we'll really enjoy it. 
So that is um, the end of my announcements. And now I get, I have the really fun, fun um, job of introducing Joni Harsler. She's a long-term member of the Tampa Audubon Society. She's done a lot of work on um, keeping cats indoors. And she's also very active with our, with her husband, Gary, with our efforts um, at Lake Park and the Bluebird Trail there. So an active member of Tampa Audubon gives herself in so many ways. And it's a real pleasure to see you here, Joni, to talk about this. This clips onto your shirt. Okay. See, there's a little clippy thing my thumb was. Just use some clippy. I can't see it, is it? Want me to do it with? Sure. Okay, you hold on to this. Okay. It's on. I still have my director pen like that. <laughs> now, do I need this too? It's right here. It depends on how good your voice is. Can everybody in the back hear me? Okay. <laughs> I'll just mention, mention this while. Uh, well, he's working on that for me, which I appreciate too. And that is, um, we actually had a, a campaign. Was how long ago was he? How long would you say? Twenty years ago, um, fifteen years ago, uh, on keeping cats indoors. And that campaign was where we actually went around to schools. We gave uh, programs to them. We taught them uh, the benefits of keeping cats indoors and, of course, talking about the birds in that part as well. And uh, one thing you'll be interested in, Lucy, is that one of the meetings that we had where the kids were awarded prizes the first year happened to be at your store. So, uh, and which has a cat indoors. Do you still have a cat indoors? Yes. Uh, we also had um, hundreds of posters that were then posted at Animal Services. Since that time, Animal Services managers have all changed, which is really has, which has really changed a lot about keeping cats indoors. And in the past month, I've studied it even more since I was going to do this speech. And uh, how many of you are aware of what the rules are now for cats? Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna see these today, and uh, what they were about 15 years ago. And we, by the way, we did win a uh, state award for the Cats and Doors campaign that we did. Remember that? And we won what for that? You remember that? You don't? <laughs> really? Okay. Anyway, we did. Uh, but the. Ordinances in Hillsborough County used to be that the rules for cats were the same as for dogs. So if your cat was off your property, it had to be on a leash, it had to be in your control, uh, it had to be uh, licensed, all of these things. But now these have all changed. So anyway, I did find an old picture of one of the uh, people who won and I'll just pass that around. It's just kind of cute that we had so many pictures, but we did put all those posters at Animal Services, which is a wonderful thing. So one of the reasons uh, I'm here, obviously, is talking about cats indoors. And today we're going to look at why is that better for cats? How many of you have a cat, by the way? Good for you. How many, dare I ask? How many keep them indoors? Okay. Great, good to hear. And it's not that you have to confine the cat. It's basically that the cat is healthier and safer if we go, if, if it's not a cat at lar large. At the same time, it's also better for people, which we'll go into 
and it's better for birds. Some people think it's okay to leave the cats outside, obviously. Um, but what about this creature? Is anyone who can tell me what this creature is? What this? Exactly. It's a Bur Burmese python. It showed up about 30 years ago. And it, how do you think it came in? It was a pet. So uh, the pet trade, uh, they come in, they eat mammals, they eat birds. They were released or escaped. But uh, the Florida Conservation Commission encourages us to remove them and euthanize them. Okay, but just like the cats, that was someone's pet. That's food for thought. How about this guy? Have you seen him in Florida? Who can tell me who he is or she is? Wild pig, Wild pig. the feral pigs. Uh, they're feral hogs. They're from the 16th century. Um, and anyway, they are caught, obviously, as you know, because of the group that I'm speaking to, they are really affecting the negative, negatively the ecosystems by rooting up and destroying uh, natural habitats. They're also dangerous to humans. And is it legal to trap them and do away with them? Absolutely. Is it getting harder? Who knows, have you seen this guy around? Was he a pet? Yes, he was a pet too. And what is he? Bufo or cane toad, exactly. And uh, they're, you know, they're another invasive species. The issues with them is that they are eating the, the uh, native toads. There's a little, I need, can you help me with this? This is covering part of, I need that. Oh, you want that? No. Thank you. Anyway, they are, uh, if, if you do see that, you are allowed to privately or uh, you can humanely euthanize the, the animal. Uh, if you keep them inside and they're enclosed as a pet, you can do that, but it's not advised because they're, they have a toxin that will kill dogs and cats. That's been recommended too. We do that with the uh, Cuban tree frogs. Yep. And now we can't go on. <laughs> they changed it. Yep. You can just stay here with me. I read the same thing too that they want you to use. Uh, what was it called? Uh, yes, yes. It's what you put on when kids are teething. Yeah. Yeah. I'll advance it for you. Okay. That sounds good. Are those the cane toads or are those the Cuban tree frogs? Tree frogs, tree toads. I need a nap. No, just kidding. <laughs> Okay. Well, let me let me sit right here. <laughs> People in the laugh are hysterical. <laughs> okay. How about this guy? Do you rec 
Am I in front of it? Okay, we're good. Do you recognize me? Isn't this beautiful? What is it? Lionfish. Why do you think it's in this list? Invasive species. Thank you very much. Uh, the lionfish came to the United States in the uh, 1980s through pets, pets in aquariums. Yep. It preys on native species, has venomous spines, they eat native fish. The biggest thing I noticed uh, was also that they, they destroy the species of fish that keep the algae in check on reefs. So that's, they're tied into the reefs, they stay in those areas. Did we, did we get divorced? Okay. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I got a Jim, Dear John letter right away, but anyway, it's okay. <laughs> Anything I can do? No. And what about me? Pretty cool. It's an African snail, giant African snail. Guess where this is? Pasco County. Just came into Pasco County. However, they are controlling it. This snail is prohibited. You can kill it, although it's very dangerous to humans. You're not supposed to touch it uh, because it has a, a rat wing worm, lung worm. <laughs> Let me try this again. <laughs> a rat lung worm and parasite that affects humans. I think it affected me and I can't talk. But anyway, <laughs> I'm going to do my best. They will also eat stucco and paint. But Pasco County has done a really good job of getting rid of these. But if you see him, he's huge and don't touch him. And this guy, you all recognize him. He's wondering where his home is. What do all these animals, fish, snakes, toads, Barrel hogs, what do they all have in common and why have I gone through them? They're all pets. They harm other wildlife. And they're in Florida now, which is, and they're non natives. What's a harm in it? A non-native is any species that occurs outside its native range as a result of deliberate or accidental introduction by humans. They compete for habitat. They don't have any natural predators. And these six are the Florida's least wanted and most invasive and destructive non-native animal species that are wrecking Florida's ecosystems. But guess what's number one? Surprise, surprise, it is a cat. They are the most recognized threat to global biodiversity, have contributed to the extinction of birds, mammals, and reptiles in the wild. This doesn't mean we don't like cats. I love animals. I love all animals. But it does teach us that just because you have an animal you've chosen to have as a pet, it should not roam unattended because of the results. The population of these animals, especially the cats, have become extremely unbalanced. As studies show, they cannot be managed, so they won't harm other species. There are no natural species tied to this invasive, unbalanced species. There are no natural predators for these. But the important part of the cats on the environment and wildlife is a human problem, just like the others. They didn't come here on their own. They didn't get released on their own. An 11 year study in Virginia studied 21,000 mammals and found that cats were the second leading cause of injury to all of the mammals that were brought into their clinics with an 80% mortality. That 80% mortality is because of the diseases in the cat's mouths. So when they're attacked, they have a very low chance of survival. Unfortunately, cats are not natural predators. They kill indiscriminately. We have domesticated cats and now need to continue to take responsibility for seeing that they're safe indoors. 
sending them out into the wild subjects them to cruelty, terrible diseases, risk of being hit by cars or brutally killed. This week I talked to two trappers and I asked them about trapping cats because some people have called and wanted to know what they do with a feral cat. One trapper told me that he can't do it anymore because the regulations are so difficult that he can't go through the whole process and handle it. The other trapper told me that he does it and will do it, euthanize a cat, a feral cat. But he said that there are so many mangled, terrible, destroyed cats from the coyotes right now, because they're roaming around free, that you don't even want to know. He was so, I need a word, he was so, this is the guy that sees this every day, and he was so upset at the destruction of these animals. It's terrible, it's terrible. Anyway, they do run the risk of the cruelty, terrible deaths, diseases, risk of being hit by cars or brutally killed. We're gonna get happier in a minute. <laughs> okay, so it's better for cats if they're inside. Outdoor cats suffer from injuries, parasites, diseases. Uh, they're not maintained. They don't go to the doctor. They don't go to the veterinarian. Uh, an indoor cat lifespan is 10 to 15 years. Yay, and we know some that are even longer. While the average lifespan of an outdoor cat is two to five years. When I'm telling you these things, some of these things, these are not things I've experienced. These are scientific studies. These are analysis that are real. Outdoor cats face many dangers and the risks that shorten their lives, the fights, diseases, vehicles, poisoning, predators, euthanasia, or euthanasia. Indoor cats tend to live longer and safer lives. So we know that it's good for the cat. How about the birds? Because now we also know that they're the predator of the birds. Cats and birds are not a good combination, so keeping cats indoors is also better for them. Uh, I spoke with a veterinarian this week also, and I asked him another question I'll tell you about later, but uh, he was very concerned with the piping plovers. He said, we're worrying about the snakes in the Everglades, which is a worry. And he said, but a worse disaster are the cats on these islands. Gary and I just got back, back from Galapagos, and we visited five islands that were uninhabited. Those uninhabited islands had wildlife that was incredible. However, from time to time, people had released cats there and they had to go in, they had to set traps. They had, they, anyway. So there is a great risk everywhere, but it's a human created one. Outdoor cats are the number one threats to birds. Unfortunately, from these pictures, you can see that the predation by domestic cats is the number one direct human caused threat to birds in the United States and Canada. Outdoor cats kill approximately 2.4 billion birds every year. That may be, seem unbelievable, but it represents the combined impact of tens of millions of outdoor cats. A misconception is that if cats are fed, that they're not going to kill the birds. And this was another topic that the veterinarian had brought about. Even well-fed cats have and will kill. Upon reflection, most cats owners will have observed the behavior when a cat plays with a feather toy or when they deliver a little lizard that they found or killed or whatever. Unfortunately, the mere presence of cats outdoors is enough to cause significant impact to birds since cats are recognizable, are not recognizable predators. Even the presence of a cat around one of the bluebirds' nest or any bird's nest does affect 
the chicks and reduce their nest success. And how is keeping cats indoors also better for people? We have more birds. What? We have more birds. That's a really good one. That's true too. That's that's a good one too. I love these. That's 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 a big one, and I'm surprised we don't hear about that more. This gets a little negative again, but the truth is, all of those are true and wonderful, and I love those answers probably better than this. There are contaminants in the environment that the cats leave that affect humans. And I only noted two of them. One is toxoplasmosis, which is caused by the infection with the parasite toxoplasmosis gondii. Although the parasite depends on cats, which is the definitive host, to complete its life cycle, it may infect all warm-blooded species. This is the one that if you're pregnant, you've got a problem with the uh, disease due to the potentially severe consequences of infection and potentially high levels of environmental contamination. Toxoplasmosis is a serious concern and a ne neglected public health threat that impacts, that impacts approximately a third of the humans. It's spread through the cat feces, often found in yards and gardens. Anybody ever find that? I have. And it distributes the oocytes, which are the eggs, which can be inhaled or ingested. 74% of cats are infected by it, and an infected cat with it expels hundreds of millions of infectious oocytes into the environment and may remain for years in the soil or water. The other one I focused on was cats and rabies. Cats are the top carrier of rabies. Surprisingly, you think it's dogs, but it's not. It's cats in the United States and have outpaced dogs for decades. Since 2000, the proportion of rabbit cats to dogs has ranged from 2.2 in 2000 to 4.4 in 2010. The rabies prevalence in dogs have significantly been reduced since they require mass vaccinations and aggressive control of strays. Well over 6,000 people received the post-exposure prophylaxis every year in the U.S. due to potential exposure from cats and treatments and are in excess of $1,000. So keeping cats indoors, again, helps the people. We're not going to get, hopefully, any of these diseases. The Hillsborough County, Hillsborough County Ordinance that I pulled up most recently, this has been voted on since I wrote this up. I'm not sure how the vote came out. They wanted to make a change to it again. There's a group that wants to do that. And it's not positive. Uh, in Hillsborough County, animal at large ordinance says no dog or cat shall be allowed to stray, run, or go at large on any public property or street, sidewalk, park, or on the private property of another without the consent of the property owner. Do you know how often people will say to me, my neighbor has a cat that's coming over in the yard, defecating in my garden? I mean, have you heard that? It's not an uncommon thing at all. And now we know the diseases that can bring to people. Any pet went off, went off its owner's property or in a public place like a neighborhood sidewalk, farmer's market or outdoor cafe, that'd be great, must be under the direct control by a means of a leash cord chain at all times. If cited, the fines are at least $100 and up to $500. They also must be vaccinated along with the ferrets and dogs. So all pets old, older than four months must be vaccinated. If they're not, fees are 100 to $500. So the incentives, oops, that doesn't belong there. We're going down to the bottom.
Why should we worry about the birds? This, this is way out of order, but I don't know what I can do. Okay, also this is a recent report from uh, the health department in Newport Ritchie. They just issued a rabies alert. This was on April 4th for the West Central Geographic region of Pasco County in response to a cat that tested positive for rabies on April 4th. All the citizens should be aware. So that's telling you that uh, it's real. How many of you have heard about TNR? Two people. TNR stands for? That's it. It's trap, neuter, or spay, and release. So what about that as a solution? The reality is, it's said to be, they, they, they tout it as a program that trapping, trapping feral cats, spaying or neutering them and releasing them into the environment will reduce the numbers. That doesn't help the birds any, obviously. The scientific evidence regarding trapping and release clearly indicates that it's not an effective tool to reduce feral cat populations. Rather than slowly disappearing, studies have shown that the cat colonies persist and may actually increase in size. It does not operate in an enclosed system. Pasco County encourages people to put up a big screen in the area, take in the cats, and they're protected, and you're protected. And a lot of people I know do that. It really works. Once feral cats are spayed or neutered, then they are abandoned back into the environment to continue the feral existence. Not only is this systematic abandonment inhumane to the cats, it perpetuates numerous problems such as wildlife predation, transmission of disease, and property destruction. The reason I know about this, and people will want to contradict my opinion, is I did it. I had cats in our backyard that were feral cats. They couldn't be adopted. They were, anyway, they were feral cats. We trapped probably a hundred cats that went to Hillsborough County Animal Services. Most of those cats, I believe, were euthanized. But I had one cat in there that I felt like must have been somebody's cat. And it was a nice little cat, but it was in my yard and it got in my trap. So I wrote a note when they picked up that trap and said, I'd like to know about adopting this cat. What do you think? Should he be adopted? And the woman from Hillsborough County called me. She was an expert at what she did, not me. And she said, if you really want to adopt a cat, she said, this is not the cat to adopt. She said, I can touch this cat because I'm trained to do this. But this cat is leading a terrible life. It has an upper respiratory infection. It has parasites. It's not a happy cat. And I'm like, okay. And she really appreciated that. I was in tears. And she said, this cat will be euthanized. It's very peaceful. It's not painful. And it is the right thing to do. That was really a difficult time for me, but it satisfied my feelings about euthanizing cats that are not good for the environment and not healthy in the wild. So when I, uh, before I did that cat, I then went to, I guess it was after that cat, I contacted a group of TNRs and I joined them. And I went to the neighbor's house who was feeding the cats. And we at six o'clock at night or seven o'clock at night at dusk, we would set out traps and the cats that she was feeding every night, we would catch one. And we would then uh, drag it down to one of the animal hospitals who would then spay it and then bring it back and we released them into the wild. I was part of that. I collected money from all my neighbors. I really wanted to do the right thing 
But cats didn't go away. Cats continued to uh, increase in the colony. So I called the woman Pat. And I said, Pat, it's Joni behind you. How are you? How are the cats doing? And I said, I want to talk to you about the, and she said, it doesn't work. This is the feeder of the cats. She said, it doesn't work. And I said, thank you so much. I agree. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for the cats. It doesn't work for the birds. However, Hillsborough County is now a supporter of TNR. So that's what we're fighting. And that's what we have to deal with and try to come up with some things we can do. If you want to keep feral cats away, the best thing is not to feed them. So don't put up food. Uh, use a motion activated sprinkler if you just want to keep them away. Make your soil so that they, it is less desirable by making it prickly. You can put chicken wire down. That does work. They don't like to feel it on their, on their paws. Uh, put up things that move to discourage them. Uh, you can also spray vinegar and water together and do that. Coffee grounds. You can trap the cat with a live trap and contact animal control for removal, move any food source, uh, and avoid allowing your children to play in sandboxes because that's, again, you know the answer to that. And treat your cats like dogs. You guys, this is like preaching to the choir, but anyway. <laughs> Are our birds valuable enough for us to make the effort? Why are they important? We have to be proactive and use science to change. We have to speak up and we have to get involved. We have to get with the county commissioners. We have to do something. So, you know, if, if somebody tells you a political thing that you don't agree with, we can sit back or we can speak up. And this is the same kind of thing where it's time to speak up. Help maintain the pleasure of hearing a perula singing or a tohi calling, a red star flashing her yellow feathers. Will it be worth it? Save the ground nesting birds and emperor penguins that incubate, that incubate their eggs in the Antarctic in the winter. I have these in my yard, by the way. There are many things birds can do and we cannot, but however, there's one critical thing, ability that human beings here have that birds don't. And that's the mastery and control of the environment. Birds can't protect our wetlands, manage a fishery or air condition their nests. They only have instincts and physical abilities that have served them years longer than human, human beings have been around. And now human beings are changing the planet too quickly for birds to adapt. But the future of most bird species depends on our, our commitment to preserving them. Only you can answer if it's worth protecting them from one of their greatest foes and one of our best loved friends and provide a happy, safe, and home for, for both. You can do this for the benefit of our cats, the birds, and even us. So I ask you in closing, please spread the word. You have any questions? Thank you. <laughs> no question, not a question, but just thank you for, for all that information. You're very much. The audience is just saying thank you for all the information. Sharing that they did not know trap neuter release is working. It's not effective. And it's it's important to know the why. Yeah. You know, it doesn't protect the birds. Right. And it doesn't also help the cat. You know, it's I'm not a fan. <laughs> yeah, thank you.